Hi guys. <clears throat> it is a spectacularly gorgeous, over the top, beautiful sunny day blue sky. Probably being blinded by the sunlight here on this gorgeous Tuesday morning, January 28th, 2020. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization outside of the paradise of Inverness, Florida on this gorgeous what did I just say? January 28, 2020, and this is Sam Mitchell, and you have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles, where I do what I do every day, and that is chronicle the collapse of a civilization and a planet. And before I dive into today's, I have a few big thank yous to send out for the folks supporting whatever this crazy thing I do on YouTube is. Send out three big thank yous to folks pitching into my PayPal account. A big thank you to this nice fellow right down here from Florida who says he wants to remain anonymous. Thank you, Mr. Anonymous, for your very kind PayPal donation to support my work. Uh, brother Michael Radford. Thank you very much, brother. And of course, we cannot forget, cannot forget Marty Knudsen. Marty Knudsen for his latest uh, kind contribution to my work here on YouTube. Marty, I, I pretty sure Marty has become my number one my number one angel of all times, uh, Marty Knudsen, whoever you are, brother, I really, really appreciate your never-ending support of what I'm doing here and anybody who has ever supported me and the little dog in Collapse Chronicles. Guys, I really, really do appreciate it. All right, so I have a choice between two. I'm sorry, I cannot remember my alert listeners who have sent these to me. Oh, uh, we're going to flip a coin. We have Collapsology Constructing an Idea of How Things Fall Apart. Choice number one or choice number two is Reimagining the Human. Reimagining the human, uh, well, any image other than the one we got can <laughs> can only be better. Uh, these are both long involved. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna get back to reimagining the human by Eileen Christ tomorrow. So let's dive in, <clears throat> and I'm only gonna be able to read a small portion of this. I'm gonna get to as much of this as I can, and you can go on the link. This is a long, long piece from a the New York Review of Books by some fellow named Harrison Sketley, and titled Collapseology, Constructing an Idea of How Things Fall Apart. Uh, this is, good lord guys, this is a book length book review in itself. And what this is, is a review of, uh, it would be real nice, this is the New York Review of Books, and try to figure out what book they are uh, reviewing. Good luck on that. But anyway, it's it's some French title. This is all in French. Uh, anyway, it's the newest book, and I'm not even going to attempt the title of it, by a two fellows, Pablo Servine, S-E-R-V-I-G-N-E, -E, and Raphael Stevens. Uh, anyway, an English language edition... <coughs> will be forthcoming, and I hope I can get these guys on the show. I don't even know if they speak English, but anyway, let's see uh, what they have to say about collapsology 
in 2020. Okay, so uh, talking about Pablo Servine, disenchanted with the main tenets of conventional environmentalism, Servine is foremost among a young generation of thinkers, scientists, and activists who call themselves, not without a hint of irony, collapsologues. Of course, I prefer the term collapsitarian. We've also heard collapsnik, but he goes with collapsologue. His first book, the 2015 bestseller co-authored with Raphael Stevens, titled How Everything Can Collapse, a brief manual of collapsology for present generations, offered a diagnosis of our, quote, thermal, thermal industrial civilization and a prognosis of its coming collapse in an English language edition is forthcoming. So maybe this is the review of the 2015 book, How Everything Can Collapse. But anyway, whatever it's a review of. <clears throat> Collapsology, or as Servine and Stevens define it, the quote, applied and transdisciplinary science of collapse, close quote, proposes to free environmentalist thought from the linear or progressive understanding of history implicit in such faiths as sustainable development, green growth, or the energy transition. And he puts all of these in quotes because clearly anybody, any collapse log knows damn well there is no such thing as sustainable development, green growth, or any sort of energy transition away from fossil fuels. These are, you know, the big myths of the mainstream <clears throat> environmental uh, community. It's what separates what I would call collapsitarians <coughs> from the greenies. And, uh, <clears throat> where was I? The story of human societies, which Servine and Stevens suggest, is ultimately the story of their int of humans' <coughs> interactions with their natural environments is circular. The pendulum of human history swings between moments of our being harmoniously embedded within natural processes. I would like to know which moments he's referring to, huh? And periods of population concentration, political centralization, and an urge to transcend the Earth's resource constraints. We develop economies of scale agglomerate extractive industry on a grand scale, but ultimately we over-exploit our natural foundations, which is exactly what we are now doing on a global scale. Building off of Jared Diamond's 2005 book, Collapse, which focused on these dynamics in primarily pre-modern societies, Servine and Stevens argue that the same iron law of history applies to our modern, hyper-connected, concentrated, and self-confident industrial society of today. The reasons are manif manifold and many will be familiar to readers of recent ag Anglophone environmental bestsellers such as David Wallace Wells' The Uninhabitable Earth, arguably a mass market work of collapsology in its own right. <clears throat> okay. First, there are what Servine and Stevens call the Earth's, quote, 
crossable thresholds. These concerns make up the majority of what we now think of when we discuss the environmental crisis. These are soft thresholds because nothing fundamentally prevents humans from burning the totality of the earth stocks of fossil fuels and heating our atmosphere well beyond one and a half or two degrees Celsius, which most scientists now conclude is the red line for averting the worst effects of global warming. That these thresholds are viable does not, however, mean that transgressing them will be any less devastating as the IPCC's landmark 2018 study on warming above one and a half degrees argues, crossing these thresholds would spell unquantify, well, will spell unquantifiable but devastating damage to biodiversity and the globe's natural processes, such as, for example, ocean currents. A series of dire feedback loops would kick in, meaning will kick in. The melting of Arctic permafrost, for example, which would further heat the Earth's atmosphere. What's worse, many signs suggest that these tipping points are closer than we previously understood. Hmm. What this would, what this will, all mean in terms of human pain and suffering ought to be enough to make us want to avoid these thresholds at all cost. Heat waves, droughts, and other forms of extreme weather will increase in frequency and severity. Agriculture will become re less reliable and suffer declining yields. Rising sea levels will mean the submersion of many coastal regions. Accustomed to the relatively stable climate that prevailed during the Holocene, the geological epoch since the last ice age, our societies will, will buckle under the new conditions created by our experiment with fossil fuels. Skirmishes, if not outright wars, will result over arable land and dwindling fresh water reserves and mass migration from the parched climates around the equator will provoke nationalist backlashes in the habitable parts of the world. Can you say build the wall? All of this against a backdrop of raging wildfires. A grim future indeed. So uh, that's pretty much a, uh, a review of this book, but it goes on, so I'm going to keep talking for uh, another few minutes here. Most discussions of the environmental crisis stop here, however. We then, well, the, you know, the, uh, the apocalyptimist, uh, hopium-soaked greenies, that's what they mean by we. We then go on to demand an end to fossil fuel extraction and the redoubling of our efforts to convert our economies to renewable forms of energy. Initiatives such as the Green New Deal express a growing sentiment that the private sector will not by itself transition its practices, let alone those of our society as a whole, toward a more sustainable energy system. If anything, the opposite is the case. 
the revelation that oil multinationals such as ExxonMobil have for decades known of the ruinous effects of greenhouse gas emissions has justified the suspicion that liberal politics, as usual, will not suffice. With good reason, we now talk of the need for a full-scale social mobilization of the kind we engaged in to fight World War II. <clears throat> France's collapsologues, however, view all of this as wishful thinking. Well, it's not just France's collapsologues. Uh, there's one collapsolog here in the Trumpville of Inverness, Florida, agreeing 100% that all of this is wishful thinking. I can think of a few other words, but i got to remember what channel I'm on. Yves Cochet was the environmental minister under... Lionel Jospin's social government in the early 2000s, he has since emerged as one of France's more high-profile collapsologues and was a co-founder and president of what might as well be considered the group's first think tank, the Institute Momentum. Cochet regards the trajectory of traditional environmentalism with which he has heavily engaged as largely what he calls a failure. When I asked him what he thought of the new radical turn embodied by visions such as the Green New Deal, he was circumspect seeing them as little more than a rehashed and slightly democratized version of the old sustainable development. Quote, I don't believe in it, meaning the Green New Deal, I don't believe in it for one instant, he said. Efforts such as the Green New Deal suffer ultimately, quote, from the technological illusion. It is the Californian technological dream in disguise. <laughs> Close quote. I might have to get this guy on the show. For Servine and Stevens, the horizon of sustainable development, a green industrial society shorn of its addiction to fossil fuels ignore what they call the Earth's, quote, uncrossable thresholds. <clears throat> the Earth being a closed system in which a finite quantity of resources is available to a variable population of exploiters, meaning us, poses the inexorable question of limits, plans to transition our energy system from fossil fuels to renewable sources, sources such as wind and power for pa wind and solar power, for example, and still assume an exponential expansion in energy use will not be able to overcome the fact, the fact that these new technologies depend on the exploitation of a very limited quantity of rare earth metals as the work of Michael Clare, author of The Race for What's Left, uh, <clears throat> argues, the race to access these resources is rapidly becoming a geopolitical battlefield in its own right. The age of expanding energy exploitation remains the age of fossil fuels. Ultimately, the critique goes, 
the fatal weakness of traditional environmentalism is its inability to think beyond economic growth. If the Malthusian anxiety over resource shortages is as old as modern political economy, the collapsologues harken back to the conclusion provided in 1972 for the Club of Rome and the Limits to Growth. That celebrated study, also known as the Meadows Report, predicted that a confluence of resource shortages, among which the most important being the advent of peak oil and a ballooning world, pop, world population would read will spell disaster for humanity in the 21st century. The global economy would enter a period of downward stagnation by the 2020s, we shall see, provoking a precipitous decline in global populations in the following decades. We shall see. The flippancy with which the collapsologues, de collapsologues declare that this future is just around the corner can be quite chilling. Uh, quoting Cochet, quote, we must prepare small-scale resilient bioregions close quote, on the scale of only a few thousand inhabitants, economic circuits must be scaled down to local ecosystems and resources eschewing global supply chains. Visions of the good life that are predicted on unlimited mobility and expanding human wants must be replaced by an ethics of rootedness, the joy of living and working in a dis defined space, our assumption of history as an unending process of centralization and unification towards the universal state is running up against an ecological wall. By 2035, the French Republic, the European Union, will not exist. And it goes on and on from there. I'm going to put the link on to here and uh, encourage you to read this yourself. But it is a gorgeous day here in the end times, and I have to go see a woman about buying a trailer to uh, park out of here on my little bit my little Florida bivouac for the end times so get out there and enjoy this planet while you still can on this beautiful day bye guys <clears throat>